So welcome to the OrthoClips podcast series. I'm Saqib Rahman, and today I have with me Dr. Scott Cozen, who's Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at uh, Temple University and Chief of Staff at the Shriners Hospital for Children uh, in Philadelphia and team leader of the Touching Hands Project at the American Society for Surgery of the Hand. And uh, we're going to be talking about newborn brachial plexus injury, management challenges. Thanks, uh, Scott, for coming on the podcast. Appreciate it. It's my pleasure. So uh, we'll get right into it. How did you get interested in the field uh, in this particular topic? Uh, people turn to you when they have questions about this issue. How did you get into it? So, so like most of us who are focused on a field, it's usually a, a mentor. So for me, when I was an orthopedic resident, I decided I wanted to do hand surgery. I then did hand surgery at the Mayo Clinic during my fellowship. And during that time, I met a surgeon named Mike Wood. And Mike Wood became a, a mentor to me at that time and still to today. And he was the first person to, inter, in, to open my eyes to brachial plexus surgery. I'd never done it as a, as a resident. And as a fellow, I started to do it and I, I liked it. And he taught me so much about the brachial plexus that when I came out in the clinical practice, I felt that that was something I liked to do as part of my routine practice. And then over the years, it's just grown and grown. And currently, it makes up about 50 or 60% of my practice. And so we do a lot of it. Okay. I think that's uh, it's nice to hear the kind of background of how that happened. But that's how, I guess, so many people uh, um, kind of fall in love with what they do. Um, well, well like, let me, let me, uh, so I think also, if you look at it now, so we when we started doing Plexus, we really started doing Plexus at about in about year 2000. So that's when we really focused our practice. So over the last 20 years, we now have done a lot of plexus surgery and taken care of a thousand of children, thousands of children. And what's happened is I now have a partner, uh, Dr. Z or Dr. Zlatlo, and then we have trained multiple fellows that now do brachial plexus in babies. So it's almost like if you build it, it, they will come. And it's been that way with our practice in brachial plexus injuries and those fellows that we train to treat brachial plexus injuries. Got it. Um, so what are the, maybe just let's uh, then go over the basics uh, real briefly. What are the key clinical features and diagno uh, diagnosis of brachial plexus injury? Maybe some, you can throw in some clinical pearls uh, for some of the residents or other um, docs out there listening to this, just the basics. Yeah, so the basics are extremely interesting. Everyone sees the, the brachial plexus diagram and everyone or every resident draws that diagram prior to taking a test. But that diagram is not clinically applicable. So we have this concept of that's the diagram for test taking, but from a clinical standpoint, a brachial plexus examination is relatively straightforward. Right, so even in the babies, we're able to examine them fairly quickly. And the key clinical features initially are the practical anatomy. So C5 and C6 nerve roots comprise the upper trunk, and that controls all your shoulder range of motion, mainly your rotator cuff and deltoid. It controls elbow flexion and forearm supination, and that's the upper trunk. The middle trunk, which is C7, mainly controls elbow extension, wrist extension, finger extension, and forearm pronation. And then the lower trunk, which is C8 and T1, controls grasp and fine motor function, such as crossing your fingers. Everyone thinks a baby would be difficult to examine, but they're much easier than a two-year-old, and they're much more compliant than an adolescent. And what you want to look for on the clinical examination are those particular findings. Now, first and foremost, when a baby's born with a brachial plexus injury and no fractures, their passive range of motion should be full and painless. That's a big clinical pearl. If when you move that newborn baby's arm, it hurts, something is going wrong, something else is wrong, I'm sorry, like a fracture or like a dislocation. So that's point number one. Point number two is that when you put your hand in a baby's hand, they grab it. That's called a palmer grasp reflex. That lasts for about six months, and that infers that the lower trunk, or C8 and T1, is working. As you move up to, exa to examine the C7 and then C5 and C6 nerve roots, 
babies respond to stroking and tactile feel. So you are able to examine a baby pretty quickly to see what part of the plexus is involved. And there's only three types of birth palsies. One that affects C5 and C6, which is called a herbs palsy. One that affects C5, C6, and C7. So you'd add weak elbow extension and a wrist drop and weak finger extension. And then the global type, which is all five nerve roots, and there's no movement whatsoever. So first clinical pearl, you should be able to examine a baby. You need to make sure their passive range of motion is full. That's a great pearl. Um, what about myths? Um, what do you hear that you constantly have to tell your learners uh, is different from what they thought? Um, or maybe even um, non-orthopedic doctors or parents? What are some of the myths out there that you wanna kind of put straight? And there are so many myths surrounding brachial plexus birth injuries, and they're, they're all over the place. So uh, myth number one, right, is we used to immobilize the child for an extended period of time for fear we could further injure the plexus. Total myth. We move them right away. As long as there's no fracture, we start past a range of motion early. We no longer put them in a sling. We no longer put them in a swath. We no longer pin the arm to the side. We simply move them right away because the goal is to maintain a supple limb with full passive range of motion because when the nerve recovers or how it recovers, the muscles will be weak and they need, they need to move a, a supple joint. That's myth number one. Now, myth number two is that you should delay starting therapy. Therapy is very important because the parents are often afraid to move the limb and the therapist will move the limb for them. However, myth number three is that therapy will affect nerve regeneration. It doesn't. It, the regeneration depends upon the amount that the nerve was injured at the time of birth. But therapy is important, but not important for nerve regeneration. Other myths so surrounding the injured arm is that it hurts the baby. Uh, neurogenic pain doesn't occur in babies. It occurs in adults and adolescents, so it doesn't really hurt. Uh, another myth is that you shouldn't... Uh, draw blood from the arm, that's hocus pocus. You shouldn't take a blood pressure from that arm ever, that's hocus pocus. Another hocus pocus thing is as the child gets older, the previous myth was they shouldn't participate in sports, but a study out of Boston Children's Hospital showed that if they participate, they're no more prone to be injured than their able body counterpart. So we no longer place restrictions on kids or adolescents with brachial plexus palsies with reference to their activity or their participation in things like karate, gymnastics, et cetera. Okay. I mean, you know, I think in describing those myths, you certainly also gave us some management uh, tips or principles. What would you say um, overall uh, are the um, principles of management once you've diagnosed uh, a child with this? So once you diagnose the newborn with a brachial plexus palsy, the first principle of management is early intervention and therapy. So early intervention is the therapist teaching the parents how to provide passive range of motion, right? Then you watch and wait. And you have to remember there's three types of nerve injuries. There's the mild stretch, which we call a norapraxia, which disrupts the myelin sheath or the insulation around the nerve and they typically will re-insulate in the first six to eight weeks and recover, right? And the second type is, is if the nerve stretches more, there's some tearing of the axons, just like a stretch of Tootsie Roll or saltwater taffy, and that's called an axonometric injury, and that'll regenerate at a millimeter a day or an, in, an inch a month, so that'll have a delayed recovery, and you start to see recovery somewhere between two and six months. And if the nerve stretches even more and the ends are detached, it's called a neurotmesis. That'll not recover without surgery, and you won't see recovery in about the first six, seven, eight months, and that needs to be grafted or spliced back together uh, using nerves primarily from the legs. So the principles of management are, number one, passive range of motion. Number two, we want to watch and wait. And number three, the extent of nerve injury will dictate whether or whether or not surgery is necessary. Another myth that I forgot to mention was we used to tell parents that 95% of brachial plexus birth palsies recover. 
Unfortunately, that number was wrong. It's more in the order of two-thirds. So two-thirds recover without any impairment or limited range of motion, but one-third of children will have some form of impairment secondary to the brachial plexus injury. Okay, it's good to know. Um, you know, with uh, what we know about management, what uh, continues to be or continues to present challenges for those of you who who treat these? Uh, what are the biggest difficulties that uh, we're working on trying to overcome? So the first and foremost, we're trying to develop modalities to assess the extent of nerve injury. That would be great. But the current level of MRI or, or any imaging study, even with a 10 Tesla magnet, isn't able to see what's inside the nerve. So the typical baby that has an MRI of the brachial plexus, it'll show that there's some enlargement of the nerves that are injured, like a neuroma. But what it can't tell you is whether those fibers are in continuity or in discontinuity. So that, that's a real challenge. We need some way to assess whether the nerves are torn or not torn. In fact, electrodiagnostic studies have been shown to be overly optimistic in newborn brachial plexus injury meaning that if they're early signs or even small signs of recovery, they may overestimate the child's recovery. So in our practice, uh, we currently do not use electrodiagnostic studies in babies. We clearly use them in adolescents, but we don't use them in babies. The only use of MRI is to see whether there is a pseudomeningocele. So if the brachial plexus was torn from the spinal cord, spinal cord fluid leaks out, and you'll see this ball of fluid outside the nerve root, and that is indicative of an avulsion of the nerve root or it being pulled from the cord. However, even that MRI finding is only right about 80 or 85% of the time, meaning it's a, it's a false finding somewhere between 10 and 15% of the time. With reference to the ultimate challenge, once we have made the diagnosis of brachioplex injury, by clinical examination, some form of imaging study, some way to know whether the nerve is torn or not, and then we will need to repair the nerve. So the challenge that presents to us who care for brachial plex injury, injuries is enhancing nerve regeneration. It's a huge challenge. There are current super interesting ways that may be available in the future. So currently, what do we do now that's different than we did 10 years ago? Now, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that intraoperative electric stimulation for 10 to 15 minutes will incite the anterior horn cells to regrow faster across the neurophy or the graft. So that we currently do. But I think the coolest thing that's coming to the forefront is a fusion of nerve called a PEG fusion. So if somebody were to damage a nerve or cut a nerve, the future holds of for a PEG fusion, and when you fuse the nerve ends together, before there's Wallerian degeneration, the nerve does not undergo Wallerian degeneration. So that is being done in an animal model. It has probably years to go before it's applicable to us as humans, but nonetheless, there may be a day where we don't rely upon watching and waiting, so we'll have some imaging modality to say whether the nerve is torn or not, and then we'll be able to go in earlier and this holds true for brachial plexus and for peripheral nerve injuries. And then we'll be able to fuse these nerves together and then we'll have immediate recovery and we'll overcome the obstacles of number one, a millimeter a day or, or an inch a month, or number two, this concept of irreversible end plate demise, which means that if a muscle doesn't have a nerve for somewhere between 18 or 24 months, it shuts down forever. So if we can fuse the nerve and get some immediate recovery, then the motor end plates will stay alive forever. And then we can take our time and let our nerve regenerate at least at a millimeter, millimeter a day or an inch a month, if not faster. So I think there's a lot of future in nerve repair and nerve reconstruction. It's just going to take time, effort, and a huge amount of work on interested researchers and investigators. I didn't even hear about nerve fusion until just now. So that's really, it sounds really exciting um, for those in the field and those of us who have to take care of peripheral nerve injuries. I mean, I do myself, although 
Um, you know, when they need definitive management, I often need um, someone like yourself, but um, it sounds really exciting. It is unbelievably exciting. If we can prevent Valerian degeneration and prevent irreversible end plate demise, I think then we will have not a cure, but it's certainly a much better remedy than we have currently for nerve injuries in general. Great stuff. Well, I um, think uh, we're just about out of time. Um, so I want to thank uh, Dr. Scott Kozen um, from Shriners Hospital for Children, Philadelphia. Our topic uh, today was newborn brachial plexus injury management challenges. Uh, thank you very much.